Welcome to CCJA Sundays. Um, my name is Camila Vitaitis, and this is our weekly interview and masterclass series. And I'm really thrilled that we have an amazing trio here to present a masterclass today. Here is the Stranahan Zaleski Rosado Trio. <laughs> All right, what do you guys want to start with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what should we start with? Um, <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is really overwhelming emotionally because I haven't seen either of these guys for a long time since the beginning of the pandemic. I was trying to remember today when we released the new record. Do you remember the yeah, actual date? August, of when well, not the actual date, but it was August 2019, August 2019. And the last gig that we played, was it the CD release at? The it was standard? at the standard. Wow, so it was, it was which 2019. was 2019. So it's been a long time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. But one, one thing that comes to mind just, just at the beginning, what, what I wanted to talk to you guys about is um, this particular group, I, I wanted to talk about the history sort of of how, how we come together. We've been a band for 11 years now, since 2010. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with these these two uh, these two guys, but if not, um, Glenn Zaleski is from Boylston, Massachusetts. We met in 2005 at the Dave Brubeck Institute of Jazz in Stockton, California, and um, we were uh, among five uh, fellow musicians that were a part of that program, and we we started playing together the first day of school, and there was a really, really uh, special connection that we, we sort of felt very early on uh, when we played. And, and it's, I'm really proud to say that, that we've continued to play throughout the years. And then um, what year was that at new school? Was that 2007 when you met Rick? I think? Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, Rick Rosado on the bass, I feel like I'm introducing us as if we're at a gig, um, is from um, Montreal, Quebec. And um, he, Rick met Glenn at the new school because you guys were randomly roommates, right? Mm -hmm. Like you had not met before. I'm, right. I'm trying to remember all the history. You both signed up for the dorms, the same dorm, and they just decided. Yeah, and so that was that was um, very magical that that happened, and these guys started playing together. And then um, in 2010, Rick was invited to put together a series at a, a club where he's from in Montreal called The Upstairs. And Rick decided to put three different um, bands together. And one of the bands was this trio. And so we had, we had played a little bit. We had played a couple sessions before and it was, it was always really special, but we hadn't really gotten into anything too serious, too musically. But I just remember that first night we played together. It was, I had never felt anything like it, you know? And, you know, I feel like musicians are always talking about chemistry and, and connection and like, when you're recording an EPK for a new album, but it's really true in this case. And this is a musical situation for me that we can go years without playing, months without playing, without even talking. And from the first note, it's like, we never stop playing. That level of comfort and trust and, and love is always there. And I think that's one thing that we could talk about um, as the title of this is the art of the trio. Um, and that, that's always really been so special to me. And I always sit here and contemplate because I really haven't experienced that in many musical settings in my life. It always takes like a couple of gigs or a bit of time to sort of shake the cobwebs out and, and you know, get things going. But I just have always felt with you guys that it's, it's just there. And I think that's because of our friendship and our brotherhood, you know, the fact that we're so close as people and we have so many... Uh, musical you know our, our musical tastes are very similar you know i think and also another thing that i wrote down uh which is very funny to me is our mission statement as a band oh, <laughs> i wow. think it's always been i think it's been very i didn't write a mission statement oh. i didn't think but i think it's very it's very clear that we're all really searching for something uh collectively as a band and like our goal has always been to reach people and connect to people and try to relate to people and one thing that I, I talk a lot about with my, my students and in and, and master classes and things like that is, I think as we go through music school and we learn all these things about music, we, we focus so much on playing our instrument and, and playing, playing well, improvising well, but 
Um, one thing I've been talking about a lot is connecting with the audience and especially connecting with an audience of people that may not be musically um, trained or, you know, and jazz can be such a sophisticated art form and, and can be so um, daunting to people sometimes. But I feel like, I feel like when we're improvising together, I feel like we have that, at least have that in our minds and we have that sort of, you know, right here. And we're always, you know, I've, I've just reflecting on all the performances we've done and all the people that come up to us and just say how much they appreciated it and connected to, to what we were trying to do and musically. And I feel like that's really been important. So I wanted to start there. I just wanted to say, I love you guys. Anyway, so I wanted to start with that. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I sure I'll jump in. Yeah, this, it is it is great to I, I haven't seen I did see Colin on the street in Brooklyn uh, one time when I was waiting on the long line at the UPS store, um, which is near Colin and I are neighbors in Brooklyn. He's in Brooklyn. Rick, I haven't seen for a really long time. Yeah, almost um, a year. Now. Almost a year. But yeah, it was a very, you know, our, our from our first gigs in, in Montreal, 2010, it was a very special weekend. And uh, we had written new music that we were trying out, and there was some some electricity that, uh, fortunately, we were able to, um, you know, capture. And uh, you know, we're we're still really excited by that today. And actually, you know, I think the spark is 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 still there. I mean, uh, yeah, it never it never left. I mean, from 2010 to the live record that we recorded eight years later. I mean. I think we've all been growing together. You know, it's a very, those are very special years that we're very fortunate to have come together at that time, you know, between the ages of 18 and 20 is, is a very special time. And uh, we really were learning about music and the scene and the, the world together in that very uh, important growing time in our lives. And I think that's um, an important uh, part of our chemistry. And we're very lucky to have been able to capture that because, uh, yeah, it's just a special, special period. So, yeah, <laughs> nostalgia is high between the three yeah. of us, but it's not. But uh, but but also, uh, yeah, we're we're just uh, great friends, and I think we have a similar aesthetic. And there's 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 uh, just always such a joy. So I wish, you know, ordinarily, if we were doing something like this, we would uh, have already played a tune or two. So it's too bad that we're not able to do that now. But uh, this this talking will have to suffice. Rick, do you feel like saying anything? You don't have to. Yeah, um, I guess along the lines of what you were saying before, like, uh, you know, we can go so long without playing and then, you know, from the get go, it's just uh, clicks. And I, and I love that and I look forward to that happening again. I mean, it's been, you know, it's pandemic long that we haven't played and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I love reconnecting and I love feeling like you said, it's just kind of like a sense of home, but also, I, <clears throat> I also love feeling how, um, you know, we all grow and we all experience a lot of different things musically and personally. And, and um, you know, when we get together at that moment, we just put it all on the table and, and, and something new also comes from the thing that's so familiar. And it's always, um, yeah, and I always feel a lot of um, openness and acceptance to what everybody has to bring and offer. and. Uh, and it helps each other grow. I always learn a lot from playing with these guys. So I look forward to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think I think another thing that's really cool is, you know, we've we've been able to play as a rhythm section in other people's bands, you know, like we're in Rafal's band together. There's a great Polish guitar player for those of you guys that don't know, Rafal Sarnicki. And we've been playing in his band for probably just as long, if not longer, as as a band. And, you know. This trio also, we did, we did, a, I mean, we had plans to record, you know, for that label with, with Kurt and we, we've done, we sort of added Gilad Hexelman into the mix for a while, you know, and, and we've had special guests play with us as well. And, and for a long time, I think, I think we were getting hired as a rhythm section for other people's bands. And, and that was really, I think there was a lot of growth in that too, where we sort of had to, you know, really focus on, on some other material as far as the music goes, but it's just always so funny to me how like when it would break down to a piano solo or a bass solo, we'd just like go into our vibe, you know? But yet at the same time, what I mean by like keeping 
the other material focused. It's not like we just jumped into this other thing that the Spanish Zaleski Rosado Trio was just like, we can adapt to different situations. And I always admire that about the fact that we have this connection and, um, you know, we can bring that into other settings and it's not like, it's not intimidating. And by what, what I mean by that, one thing that was also unique about, about, you know, growing up with Glenn, like Rick, we, we met years later, but right away we started touring with, with Jonathan Kreisberg's band for a long time and, you know, um, started playing in that. So I feel like we were playing trio, but all uh, once in a while we jump into these other settings and play in a very controlled musical <laughs> environment and really learn how to do that. But, but it just, it just like, just the progression of everything just made so much sense to me and the fact that, that we were always playing and, and, you know, I really, I really just keep going back to that. Like it just, it always just feels, there's never any, any sense of doubt, you know, whenever we're playing together and it, you know, I, I feel like musically things can go anywhere. And I think in a while I was going to play a couple, couple examples of that, but I also, I wanted to talk about, seen as, as the, um, the theme is kind of the art of the trio and playing trio. Um, I think what's really special about, about this band is, is that we're a collective band. You know, it's not, it's not Rick's band, it's not my band, it's not Glenn's band, but we tend to do pretty much everything, decide everything together. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. I was thinking back on all the gigs that we've played and I feel like every night before we played, we we take some time away from, from people. We try to get into a quiet room and we've always constructed a set list together, which to me, that's, that's really awesome that we do that, you know? And I feel like I, we've done some engagements where we play like a few nights in a row. And I'm trying to remember if we kept the same set every night or if we, I think we would change things just a little bit. Um, and I know we experimented a few times with, with, not really having a set list too, which was interesting. But um, do you guys kind of remember that the same way? It's like we always kind of sat down and, and, and worked the, the set list out together. Yeah, definitely. Am I correct in, in trying to remember things in that way? Yeah, um, true. and actually I feel like I never, maybe I took that for granted, like realizing, yeah, that's very unique. I mean, there's no other band setting that I play in that where that happens, you know, it's always the right. in this case. Yeah, and I feel like I feel like every every night would just be a little different because of that, you know. And uh, another thing about our material is is we all we all write for the band. I mean, mostly, if I'm being completely honest, mostly you guys write tunes, and I, I write a few tunes here and there. But I was going to ask you guys maybe to speak a little bit about your compositions for this band. Um, when I might know the answer, but but for everyone else, like when when you've written tunes for like that we've recorded, have they been specifically for the trio, or have they been tunes you've just been working on, or a little bit of both? Glenn, maybe you could speak speak on that a little bit. Yeah, um, there there are some tunes that I've I've definitely written uh, just for the trio, and I basically won't play with other uh, people just because I don't really feel like it's right. Mm. Um, well, I mean, one thing that's very special about Colin and Rick is that um, I actually, I feel like I could actually write anything and I, I could, I mean, I, I play with, with, uh, you know, d different bands and I write different stuff, but uh, sometimes if I'm, sometimes I write for like, uh, like I know certain people are better at certain things than others and I might kind of hone what I write uh, to adjust to strengths and weaknesses, but um with Colin and Rick, I, I feel most more comfortable than with anybody else to actually write anything. Like I think I could actually I could actually take a piece of paper right now and just write some stuff and give it to Colin and Rick, and they could. Uh, I, I don't feel that comfortable with 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 hardly anybody presenting original material, and uh, mm. I would gotta thank Colin and Rick for that that openness because that that's rare. You know, I think that the what happens a lot of times you write something and people might not always be so open to it but uh yeah really with with that openness is the foundation i feel very free to write anything and and present it to uh, to colin and rick and yeah i don't i don't feel that way with any other any other group of musicians really mm -hmm. um, so yeah and in, in that sense there are certain things that i i haven't really played with with uh 
other musicians. Um, yeah. Rick, what about your tunes? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I definitely got to agree with Glenn. Um, I actually, I was as, as uh, Glenn and Colin know very well, I don't write all that much um, music. I'm often busy learning other people's music and practicing some other things. But uh, when I do get a chance to do that, um, I feel like the songs that I tend to write are pretty simple or bare bones. Like it's like maybe I'd be in trouble if I had to write for a big band or something because <laughs> everything is so simple. But in a way, it's so perfect for this trio because, as Glenn said, you can literally, yeah, I can. I can probably just jot down a note on a music stave with my eyes closed and give it to them and then it'll sound good. So <laughs> I've done that before. You know, <laughs> we played Monster Mash. <laughs> we've, we've done a lot of covers. Brit Britney Spears, Toxic. Remember we used to play that? <laughs> we used to play. Uh, I love our arrangement of I Should Care. It's a very quick story. Like we're, we're all into video games or were at one point, maybe more so than, than now. And there's a great, uh, which game was it? Baseball Simulator for the original Nintendo. And yeah. this just speaks to our friendship. Like we found the theme, f you guys discovered the theme from that video game and we kind of meshed it into I Should Care, which is very cool. And it's just funny how, um, I don't know, I think another, uh, I'm jumping a little ahead, but another thing I was gonna say is there's some, hu there's humor in our music um and sorry rick if i i skipped or jumped jumped on your answer no um, but i mean i have to say in the same uh, what i love about the band is all three of us have very different styles of writing you know um and my my tunes are very bare bones and very very roboto-y and, and paul motion is my hero so I, I definitely tend to write in that in that way but but i also love that we can just like grab grab little things like that like baseball simulator and and it's so funny and quirky and like like we might be the only ones that know what that is but that that energy that i think we're giving out is received in 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 the same way that it's it's put out you know and um you know i love playing covers with you guys too you know some of the elliot smith tunes we've read through or like billy joel um what tune do we have we done? Oh uh, yeah, so it goes. As, okay. And so it goes, you know. Um, even Britney Spears, Britney Spears talks. I mean, it's just I feel like yeah, we can we can really establish any any um, written material, and and I do think that um, it's really cool to put put these set lists together. And I've even gone back and and like tried to listen to a few things, and I really love how there are those little differences in in each set and. You know, I love how how open things continue to be. Like we definitely have moments in the music where we sort of maybe have some things planned out. You know, like one one example I wanted to play is like "On the Road," which is a tune that Glenn wrote. It's a blues, um, and there's a few musical cues that we sort of um, hold on to throughout the tune. But there there's this also 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 this thing that happens also I think on on some other tunes that we do where, where the tempo can fluctuate a lot. And it's really funny to talk about this stuff because you never really have, but um, I, was gonna, I was gonna quickly play a little bit of that tune. And I, th I don't know if you guys remember um, exactly what happened, if it was just something that happened in the studio or we talked about it, um, where the tempo just kind of moves around a bunch. And that sort of became a theme on that tune. It doesn't happen every time we play, but it's, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, is there, it, it's really interesting to play trio because, you know, one thing I was going to say is there's so much freedom in playing trio and there's so much space, but there's also such a huge responsibility when you're playing trio. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's really important to say, you know, especially as a drummer, you know, where playing improvised music, we're always orchestrating. We're always trying to to play in a way to sort of bring out, you know, specific details within the music and the drama within the music. And and those of you that know me know that I'm a very dramatic person. And, uh, you know, I try to keep people laughing and, and keep things entertaining. So I guess it's it's just fitting that 
that I am someone who likes to orchestrate things. Um, but there is a responsibility to that. And I think one of, one of the things that I wanted to talk about in that responsibility is, is sense of space. You know, there's just three musicians playing piano, bass, and drums. And for the longest time when I was younger, especially coming up with you guys, I always felt like that space was something that I had to, to acknowledge and take care of and fill. But the more, the more that I, the more that I've played and the more that I've experienced these, these, um, these moments with you guys, I realized that space is, is just as important, if not important. Um, those notes in that moment, that those moments of space are, are just as important as the, the notes that we do play. And less, less is more seems to be the theme of my life, at least the last, you know, six or seven years. And, um, I just, I feel like that, that that's something that we could talk about too, is um, what that really means. But I, I quickly want to play on the road um, for you guys. And Glenn, this was inspired by the book, right? By Jack Kerouac a little bit. Yeah, I did. I was reading the book and there is a, a, a section in the book where there, Jack and I forget, I forget everybody's name, or where they're, they're in a club listening to George Shearing and uh, there he's describing it in these very like ecstatic terms like the the lines are flowing and the energy it was a very exciting moment in the book and i thought it was a a cool moment for jazz music so anyways that's when i i i went to the piano and i wrote this little uh blues head and then i called it on the road so which is sort of kind of become I mean, we have like two theme songs, really, like Waltz for MD. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this one, On the Road, which is like, we always start with Waltz for MD and we end with On the Road. And, and yeah. those are kind of, I kind of think of them as, as theme songs. Anyways, so I want to play this. This is not, it's not a video, unfortunately, but it's, it's an audio recording. Again, the, the point of, of this video is, is to check out the interplay of the band and, and what's happening with the tempo and, um, how that how that moves around and and the flexibility, uh, and then I'll comment a little bit afterwards. <laughs> well, it's fun to hear that. It's fun to hear that again after all these years. Probably recorded <laughs> that eleven years ago. I want to thank Colin and it Rick. It was definitely. Uh, putting up with me. <laughs> I was gonna say putting up with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, but that's a lot of fun yeah and that was a very spontaneous thing i don't i don't, I don't think we ever um, talked Maybe about we it. just really need to work on our tempos i don't know <laughs> <laughs> hold it together <laughs> um no it was yeah that was spontaneous pretty sure i don't think i don't think we talked about that and and it's interesting how i don't know the, the reason i kind of brought that up too is is to talk about playing trio you know those those people out there that are that do have trios, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to, to write material, but I think that the step, the next step and the step, a step further into a, being a band and having an identity as a band is to really find ways to, to even go deeper into that material and, and try things and experiment with, um, with our tunes and with our music and, and finding, you know, not just playing the charts down, you know, I was talking about that too. I've been teaching a lot. So my head is like in that, but to really, you know, especially like playing standards and things like that, things like that. We, we do play a lot of standards in this band, um, but finding little interesting ways to sort of create um, our own spin on that, you know? And, and I know that we've taken tunes like Glenn's Deep Blue, you know, and taken certain sections and just kind of vamped on that uh, one section or, or one chord. And um, I think that that there is an art to that, especially playing trio is, is maybe having less material, but um, coming up with more creative ways of playing it and, and how it goes down and, and changing things, not, not being just like totally glued to one idea, but um, sort of exploring these ideas and going even further. And I've noticed that, you know, these past 11 years when we've continued to play that tune, that, we've sort of set a theme of like, this could go anywhere tempo wise. It could, it could move around. And that, is it that, is it a D flat chord? Da, 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 what chord is that? Or D? Oh, the, yeah, it's a diminished chord. It's a, it 
could it's a G sharp. It could, it could be. You know, a, yeah. <laughs> everything is the same. No, but uh, like you know that that's something that I was really inspired by by other bands. Like for example, Knee Body is one of my favorite bands. A great band from uh, some of the guys are from here and they have very musical cues where they'll have one musical thing that they play and it really can set up a whole different um, way of, of playing the tunes. And I, I feel like that, that, that is a part of, of what we're doing and, and part of our material. And uh, it's really fun to listen to that anyways. Um, another thing I wanted to, to mention is one thing, another thing I know I'm, I'm just ranting on here about uh, these musical discoveries and things that I've been thinking about. But another thing that I wanted to say was, you know, being a band and having material and, and having original compositions. One thing that I've, I've really tried to focus on, and especially playing in this band, is letting the, mu letting the music tell you what to play. You know what I mean? Not, not forcing things and not, not pushing an agenda or anything, but sort of, you know, getting into that space and, and sort of allowing your surrendering yourself to the music, to whatever happens. And that's another thing that I feel like I've really developed um, in my experiences as a musician and, and in life, um, not really forcing things, you know, like letting things come to you and being patient with them, you know? And I feel like a lot of times as, as young musicians, we, we're searching for that thing and that space and that feeling when we're improvising and we want it to be there all the time. We really want it to feel the same or we want to find that magic with the music and it doesn't always happen. And I think that the more that I would go on the road and play, the more I realized that like every night is going to feel different, you know, and there are going to be those moments when we get to those certain places. And that's why we do this, right? We do that to feel those things and to feel that connection. But I think once I realized that it doesn't always happen the same way, I was able to sort of let go. And I was, I was one of those people that, you know, I'm definitely not like this anymore at all. Like, I don't want to hear things that I've played. Like, I mean, if we're doing a record or something, I'll go back and listen. I used to record myself every night. I used to record us playing every night and go back right after the gig and listen to the whole gig. And, and I, I discovered that that really was kind of keeping me stuck in a certain space for a long time and would make me try to recreate the same, the same thing every night. And so I, I realized that the more I would like sort of let go and I, it really, it was really inspiring to watch. I don't know if ever, anyone has seen this, but the Brad Meldow documentary about the trio, not specifically about the trio, but he, he goes around and there's this really amazing footage of them, Larry and Jorge and Brad sitting in the back of the Vanguard and they're just teasing Jorge because he's like, he would go on the road and he would sit in the hotel after every gig every night and just listen like obsessively and just get really dark on himself. And, and you know, Brad's like, well, why would you do that to yourself? You sound so beautiful. And, and Larry goes, I've never heard any of the records that we've recorded. <laughs> and there's, there's something to that, you know, like I, I've really gotten into a space where you know, I let, let the moment happen. It's just music, you know, it just happens. And you try, you try to get into that space, you give everything you can, and you move on, you just let go. And I think that was a really important discovery for me. I don't know how you guys feel about that. Because I know Rick, being on the road with you a lot, Glenn too, you guys used to, re I mean, we record a lot of our trio gigs, but in your own playing with other bands, do you guys continue to do things like that? like continue recording and listening back a lot or what's where are you at with all of that well i haven't played a gig in a long time so it's hard to tell right well that's that too. But, um, yeah i would definitely say that i was definitely one of those musicians who was pretty obsessed with recording everything i mean i recorded every gig i recorded every session and um yeah i i, I really agree with what colin was saying how like it's good to just let go. And I certainly can learn a lot about that um, because sometimes I get too into that and it, and it can be, you know, very dark, kind of like, as you were saying, how um, Jorge Rossi from Brad Meldos Trio would get listening to it. Cause uh, it's, it's, it's hard to listen to ourselves. It's weird. Like even when you just listen to yourself speak like uh, from a recording, it's strange to hear your own voice. So uh, we're, our, we're our own worst critics, but um, <clears throat> there's also so much to learn from that too. I mean, yeah, it's it's pretty 
pretty ambiguous. There's a lot of gray area I find with that, but I like, um, it, I personally, I feel, I, I can't speak for the other guys, but like when I'm playing music, um, when I listen back to it after the fact, it often sounds quite different than how I remembered it in the moment. So for me, that's like a good objective source of the music because I feel like when I'm playing, I'm trying to not be in my head as much as possible. I'm trying to just be in the moment and create it and you know, not, not be thinking critically of myself or of others around me, just in the moment, making the best of each moment in the music. Um, but then obviously, you know, you, you, you hope it sounds good. <laughs> so, so listening back to it later is kind of a good, um, indicator of what it actually sounds like or how it actually came across so i would get a lot from that but uh definitely that can be a slippery slope you know like it's i think probably a balance is good i mean to a certain extent you it's good to know what, what the the final result sounds like <laughs> yeah 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 i it's, it, it's tough um it's like, you know, sometimes you might listen to a recording the second after you played it and not like it, but then listen to it five years later and think it's great. Yeah, for so, sure. Um, you just have to be really patient. Generally, things sound better than you think they do. So uh, you just have to be kind of cool about that. You know, if you listen to something right after you play it, that's not the best time to really judge its quality because you're going to have too much of your own insecurities about what you just played spinning around. So you have to kind of give it some time. Um, and then another thing is that um, if it feels good, then it probably sounds pretty good. Uh, so if you're, if you're playing it and you feel good, okay, if you feel good, then probably the other guys feel good and probably the audience feels good too. So if you focus on that, then you're more likely to have a product that, not product, you're more likely to have music that you can live with five years later. Um, so you gotta kind of just, be relaxed about it and see it, see a big picture. I mean, yes, it, it's complicated, but I've had times where yeah, I would listen every night and then I've had years where I would never listen to anything. It's, you know, it's a, it's a, there's phases. Yeah. I'm also thinking about the, we've done three, re, three, re, three records together. Yeah. Two studio recordings and, and, and one live recording. And I think that if I thinking back the first record, we did was recorded here in Denver. And I think we, most of what we recorded was like two, one or two takes each, right? We really, I'm trying to remember, uh, that was a long time ago. And that was with, I, Tom Burns was there. Uh, I'm pretty sure we just did one or two takes uh, each. And then we recorded Anticip, or no, sorry, we recorded Limitless in New York City at, at um, Avatar, which was amazing. Right, Rick? I mean, we didn't really, we, we've never really done a lot of takes of things. We just no, sort of, which not. is great, you know, because I've done lots of recording with recordings with other people, especially recording, uh, you know, with Jonathan, where we did like 13 or 14 takes of each tune and lots of other people where, where that happens as well. And I think that there's something to be said for that as well, you know, like sort of along the same lines of, um, letting things go and sort of letting things be what they are. I think that, you know, at the beginning I was talking about like our mission statement as a band. And I think that's something, something else I've really reflected on too is, is that confidence that we share with, with our, with our music. It's like, okay, well, that's what it was at this point in time. And, you know, albums are sort of like photo albums of our life. It, it, it's supposed to sort of, represent a time and a space in our lifetime you know and i feel like if there's if there's too much emphasis or there's too much uh worry or um treating especially improvised music in in a certain way i feel like it takes away from the moment and and from what what it really was and i think that that's something that's definitely like something i've learned playing with you guys is 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 that letting go thing that really has come from just just knowing that you know okay that's that's what it was in this moment and it might be different too and you know our third recording that we did it was a live record where we did repeat some material from the previous two albums and i feel like they were very different so i guess i guess it, it's kind of true you know you kind of like if you're able to just let things be the way that they are 
you know, when it comes back around that live record, like, I feel like we, we kind of approach things in a very different way. Um, so I, I think that that's been really cool um, to document uh, those different stages of our life and different moments. Um, and, you know, we've done a lot of different recording and we've also, as a band, we recorded a lot of, we've done a few different sessions that we never released. You know, we did the, remember we did the Katano, we did something mm -hmm. Katano with Jimmy Katz and, um, yeah. but it's been great just, and Live at Smalls, that record never came out. We were supposed to do that one. Um, but it's just great. I think, I think another, you know, I'm trying to make these points about being a band and, and what it make, what it makes, what what makes a great band. And I think it's, it's putting yourself in those situations and, and trying to document more things. And, you know, you don't necessarily have to put everything out or release everything as a record, but, you know, give yourself that, that moment in time um, and let it be what it is, get it out there and keep moving. And one thing I, I wanted to say, which was like, it's very emotional, but Glenn wrote this beautiful ballad um, for Fred Hirsch. Um, entitled Corral and you know it's it's really sad to think about how the jazz standard is gone now but we what was so moving about when we recorded that live is Fred was with us at, at, at he came to hear us play and I remember he was so moved moved to like tears you know and that was just like that was really beautiful and I'm so happy that we documented that on the record you know and um, you know it just like just goes to show you that the work that you put in reaches people, even the people that you dedicate your music to, you know, and like, that was such a special thing to have him there. And um, yeah, just reflecting on the standard being gone. And I'm just so happy that we, we got to record that record in that beautiful room. And um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a very special night. Yeah, it was a very special night. And it was very, it was uh, nerve wracking to that Fred was there, but also he had a very warm spirit and I think uh, inspired um, all of us to, to, to really play our best. And I think that it's interesting to, um, yeah, because some of those tunes we had recorded and I, but we recorded them maybe eight years ago in a studio. And then between in that time period, we, we have changed as people and, and um, we've changed as players. I mean, the chemistry is always there, but our own growth, I think, has been um, pretty significant. And, and you can really hear it on, on that record. I, I think so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we could take some questions if that's cool. Yeah, there was Did a really good there? question in the chat. Um, oh. Difference between trio specifically versus duo or like larger bands, quartet plus. Mm. Okay, well, I guess I'll, um, <laughs> I guess I'll start. Um, I actually find trio, it, usually like, gr growing up, I had played a lot of solo and I played a lot of duo and I played a lot of quintet. Uh, I played, my brother's a saxophone player, so I played uh, duo with him growing up. And then I played a lot of quintet with Colin in college. And trio was was the uh, the least familiar to me, and I actually found it to be the most difficult because of the sorts of things Colin was saying earlier about um, the, the responsibility. Uh, when there's only three people, you got to think a lot about orchestration in a different way than if you're playing saxophone. I mean, as a pianist in a trio, for example, one thing you have to think about is uh, once you're done playing a solo, what are you going to do? <laughs> You know, if you're playing quartet, you don't have to think about that because the saxophone player will play the melody or, you know, something like that. Um, when you're playing quartet and you're a pianist, you know, uh, once the saxophone player stops playing and then you start playing, you have a sort of advantage because the spotlight shifts over here. You don't really have to do anything differently. It's just the instrumentation makes the orchestration for you. But when you're playing trio, it's like, what are you going to do? You know, I just played the melody. Now I'm playing a solo. Like, how are you really going to make those things different? So, uh, and we all have to think about that together. I mean, I need to think about it as the pianist, but also, you know, Colin has to think about that. Rick has to think about that, you know. Uh, otherwise, every tune is going to end up kind of being the same. But you only have three people to, to choose from. There's only three instruments. So uh, I actually find trio to be uh, particularly difficult, but particularly fun. And, and uh, 
learning to play that way with with Colin and Rick is very fortunate. And um, I don't know, maybe they feel the same way. I mean, if you're playing duo, for example, it's in a way it's easier because I mean, if you're because if you if there's no drums or bass and it's a piano duo, then you can make all the orchestral shifts kind of by yourself. But when it's trio, I think three instruments in particular requires the most cooperation because there's there's uh it's like you can do a lot but it's not as the, the orchestrations and arrangements are not quite as automatic uh we all have to really think you know to, to use colin's word we really have to think uh orchestrationally and actually dramatically um and also dynamically because uh it's harder to be dynamic in a piano trio than maybe in a in a quartet um so yeah, that's that's that they're they're very different. They're they're definitely very very different. Um, but that's that's the big thing with trio is how can you make just three instruments be alive uh, texturally? Because uh, that sort of thing is not built in the same way as if you're playing with a larger ensemble. I think, um, <clears throat> at least from from the bass standpoint. Um, it's so much more intimate and you're so much more exposed. Mm -hmm. So I feel like every little decision I make or uh, anybody in a, in a trio makes uh, is not unnoticed, you know. Um, in large ensembles, it's kind of easier for maybe some things to go by that you, you're not like um, fully conscious of. I mean, you're, I'm sure your ears processing everything, but, but yeah, with trio, everything is under a microscope and, uh, and yeah, with, with larger ensembles, I feel like also you have to kind of, it's hard to have that intimate a relationship with that many people at once mm -hmm. and kind of in a way have to, I feel like sometimes I have to play things in a way that, um, I feel like could apply to anybody for coming from any, uh, level or any like uh, from different tastes musically and stuff and so maybe I have to you know play in a certain way for that but when it's trio with 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 people you're very familiar with you can really um, kind of I feel like I can do what I whatever I want and not have to worry about um, them um, duo is really interesting for me because well most commonly settings in duo are, are without drums. And so the, I feel like the bass is kind of the middle ground between the piano and the drums. Um, and I feel like sometimes I need, depending on the style of music, I, I often need to assume the role of the drums on the bass, um, which I actually get a lot from. I feel like um, whenever I do that, it kind of reminds me that I would like to think that way anyway in any situation because um, I really connect to that part of the music. Um, and sometimes I, I think I wish I were a drummer. <laughs> but you um, are. I won't tell you, but he's a fantastic. Rick's a great drummer. <laughs> like scary. Um, it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess on the bass, I'm trying to like combine the best of both of those worlds, you know, harmonically in the harmony and rhythm kind of in one instrument. Yeah. Yeah. I think th just quickly one one ex just thing to extend from that is I think specifically trio one thing that's really special is the roles can move around you know like something that Rick just said and, and Glenn you touched on it a bit too is is sometimes Rick you can be you can be the the melody you know you play the melody and Glenn can be percussive and I can be floating you know and and i think that's one one really cool thing about the interplay that we have is the roles are always moving around you know or sometimes i can play the melody and you guys are it's just like and i feel like that really happens in trio a lot and i think if you know duo can be interesting because there's so many different contexts that that um you know that that can be um and in quartet i feel like yeah they're there's a little more specific roles that we play as a bass or bass, drums and piano, you know, um, whereas specifically too in this band, like I just feel like the, yeah, those, those kind of responsibilities um, we, we really are aware of, but, but um, can really move around a lot. And, and I really love doing that. I really love playing free with you guys because it, things can just, just 
go a different way. And, and you guys really hear if I'm trying to play a melody and, and almost support me harmonically in a way. And, and I really enjoy that. So that's a great question. Thank yeah. you. You know, I just quickly want to say thank you guys for coming. Um, you know, thanks to everyone. And I also want to acknowledge those those important people that we lost this past week. I, I know that, you know, Chick Corea was was very important to to the three of us, especially when it comes to to talking about trio. And I know that we've had many conversations about Chick, especially with Glenn. Glenn, I know he was uh, such a huge influence on, on your playing and and um, you know, just, just want to say also to Joey Perlman, who was a very talented, wonderful young musician who I think you guys also got to know a little bit out in New York. Um, just want to say that we're, we're thinking of these people and, and Milford Graves too, another huge influence of mine that we lost. It's, there's been so much loss and, and um, it's just, it's just very important and um, very moving to be here in this moment and see all these people from, all these different parts of my life. And, and I just want to thank you all for being here and, and love you all very much and appreciate your time and sharing this moment with us. And, you know, speaking on behalf of, of Glenn and Rick, you know, we, we can't wait to make more music together and, and create that, that love and, and that energy and, and to share it with you all. And um, just thank you.